My name is Jan Christie. I'm the Senior Manager of Learning and Organisational Development at Henry Davis York. But I'm here today in a slightly different capacity, and that is as the president of CLIA. CLIA is the Continuing Legal Education Association of Australasia. So I thought as my sort of general remarks, what I would do is talk to you a little bit about what CLIA does and who we represent. Um, I also consulted with my executive committee in relation to today's hearing to get some sort of feedback from them from of what they'd like me to raise. So there's a couple of things I thought I'd just throw up and then we could potentially discuss further. So CLIA is essentially an association for people who provide legal education pretty much of any kind and in any form to the legal profession. The one area we don't cover is undergraduate law. But from that point on, our members are providers of PLT, regulators, people in in-house roles like mine, um, providers to the profession, so whether that's in an online capacity or face-to-face -face training. Increasingly, what we're finding is there are people who have roles that include elements of learning and development for lawyers but aren't necessarily all of their role. That's become far more prevalent in the last few years. There's sort of a rise of the L&D practitioner in the law firm and then a kind of changing of that role. The other area where we're finding more and more people we need to engage with are those areas where someone may not provide educational services exclusively to the legal profession, but certainly the legal profession is interested in the kinds of skill sets they're providing. So there's been quite a shift there in terms of who are members of CLIA. What is it we essentially do is we see our role as really being threefold for people in roles like mine. The first is it's, it's a, certainly a network, so it's an opportunity for us to liaise with people who are providing some kind of educational service to the very broad legal profession, so in-house, general counsel roles, bar associations, people in regulators, we cover the field. So that's one of the things we do. The second thing we do is around the education of our own people. So we hold an annual conference which focuses very much on the professional development of those who professionally develop. Um, and that's very much focused on whatever is happening in both the legal profession, because obviously we need to be well aware of that, and then in our own as a result of that. So the disruption that's happening in the legal profession is also disrupting those who provide education to those people. So there's an enormous amount of work going on in that space at the moment. And the other thing that we really want to be able to do is to be an advocate around what is appropriate professional development for the legal profession. And one of the biggest arguments or biggest debates for us is around the difference between CPD, purely for the purposes of compliance, and CPD that is truly about ongoing professional development. And whether there's an overlap between those things, whether they are in fact two entirely different things, uh, or how we can leverage one against the other. So those are sort of the broader questions we look at. When I spoke to my executive committee, a couple of the things that they sort of wanted to, me to flag were things around, you know, yes, there has been a major shift in technology and its impact on the profession. We see that at the how do we provide education and how do we provide professional development. The way in which we are asked to deliver is now very different. That, that traditional face-to-face -face environment still works, but not necessarily in the same way. People want 10 minutes on their phone on the bus, but they can't claim that under the CPD rules because it's 10 minutes. So there are things like that that cause these questions around how do those things fit together. Uh, one of the, the statements that one of my executive committee members said was, what we need to do is educate for the future world, not the present one. The tiny challenge around that is we don't actually know what the future world looks like. But, you know, we'll, we'll give it a go. So that was one of the key focuses. Stop looking so much at the present. What is it we need to do for the future, for ourselves as well as for the people we're looking to educate? And the other thing that we wanted to talk a little bit about was Yes, the legal profession as a whole is grappling with this whole idea of disruption and how they handle it, but so are all of the people who are providing services to it. So one of the questions we really want to talk about is how does that disruption affect the educators as well as the end users, 
which for us is members of the legal profession. So I thought that's my broad brush. I thought it might be more useful for us to have a chat rather than me continuing to talk. Um, thank you. <laughs> um, just on that last point, you talked about uh, disruption for um, educators in the profession. Um, what do you mean by disruption for the educators? So, look, for example, you know, in a role like mine, which is a traditional in-house role where, amongst other things, I'm responsible for the provision of continuing professional development for all of the lawyers in our firm. That's a very standard kind of role. You know, I know what sessions I need to roll out, I've got my programs, all of that kind of thing. But the sorts of things that I've heard earlier speakers talk about today around what is it they need to know, We've, you know the College of Law's business skills in that um, PLUS program, those sorts of things are quite different. So where once upon a time my junior lawyer program may have covered things like legal drafting, plain English, communication skills, those sorts of things, now do I need to start including things around leveraging pricing, understanding that kind of business environment more? I think the answer is yes. Um, how far do we need to go with making sure that the lawyers understand technology in two senses? The first is as a business tool and how they're using it, but also then the legal impact of it. So those are two quite different things. And it, as someone who's responsible for ensuring legal education, I need to really understand why those things are different and who my target audience is for those. And they're sometimes two quite different sets of people within the same firm. Mm. So, so what are some of the trends you're noticing in terms of the um, demand for CPD topics? You've obviously got the, the core ones yeah. that they have to, yeah. uh, they all always have to do, but are there any trends that you're noticing in, in terms of the demands for specific CPD topics? I, th I, think, I think there are, and I think they're not necessarily what you would expect, and they're not necessarily always the things that have been spoken about earlier today as well. They're things around resilience, diversity, understanding unconscious bias, um, you know, the way in which you build a, a working relationship, not just with the client, but with, with your own team. Um, you know, I ran sessions earlier this year around mindfulness. If I'd tried to run those even five years ago, I suspect I wouldn't have had too many people in the room. It was packed. So I think there's, there's very much that sense of what I need to provide assistance with is not just the black letter law stuff and not just the skills we've been talking about for a long time, but all of those life skills and, and things that will help people actually flourish from a mental health, from a physical perspective, as well as in their careers. So CP, to talk about CPD as this bit is just insufficient now. And I think one of the challenges we face is acknowledging that what lawyers need to learn is far broader than even just legal and business skills. It goes into what is unconscious bias? You know, what is mindfulness? Can I claim CPD units for meditation classes? I get asked that. And, and, you know, there's not a straight answer to that question. Mm, that would be an interesting one. I would have thought it was mm. no. <laughs> I'm very happy to have that discussion at any time. But, it, but it's, you know, is it something that's going to assist them in the way in which they practice? Possibly. Yeah. But the issue of CPD rules is, is a, a very different one, I think. Yeah. Can I ask you about your thoughts of the adequacy of the education that the universities are offering at the moment for lawyers? I'm a recipient of the people who come out the other end and we're incredibly fortunate because through our Summer Clark program we see some incredibly talented young people. Um, we certainly from my firm recruit from a broad spectrum of universities. Um, I've been the beneficiary of some of the people who've come out of the Newcastle program who are absolutely fantastic. Um, I think the big difference now is most of them have a level of expectation of what is available for them. And I don't just, I don't necessarily mean that in a selfish way, but there's so many different options available. Um, so what, what do you mean in terms of employment? In terms of employment, but also in terms of areas of practice, in terms of development, in terms of support, certainly in the larger law firms. Now, and that's, that's my experience. Um, I'm sure in some of the smaller practices and in regional areas, it's a very different thing. But the students that I'm seeing are, not just well educated from an academic perspective, but they're also very aware of what all of the various options 
are available to them if they end up at a firm like ours as mm. a graduate. Um, in terms of their academics, we're very lucky. We attract you know, people who do very well. Um, I, I note Fabian's discussion about um, culture, and that's obviously very important as well. It's a question of whether these people are comfortable with us. Um, but you also have to bear in mind that sometimes a bit of discomfort is good. That's going to cause some change. So in terms of what we see, we're very fortunate. We see very good people. We have great relationships with the universities and that works very well for us as well. Do, do the universities um, have any say or influence the, the topics that um, your members would, would present on? Or are they the, are the employers, the ones who are, are driving it, and the, the, sort of the legal profession as well? Look, there's a little bit of a mixture, to mm. be honest. Essentially, we are client-driven in that we're looking at a particular outcome. And, you know, I was listening earlier to what we, when you were asking questions about what would you teach in a university mm. course. My answer would be commerciality. Mm. Um, and I know that's a very broad, almost fluffy kind of answer, but when I talk to the graduates about what's the difference between what you do at law school and what you do as a first-year lawyer, we keep talking to them about the need to be commercial. And that's a very hard concept to necessarily get when you're making that transition. And I'm not entirely sure I can define it clearly, but there's something in that it's client focused. Now, in terms of what the universities provide, we often have um, universities come to us and say, we run particular kinds of programs. We've developed these as part of our um, CPD offering can we partner with you to do those? So it comes from both sides, mm. but ultimately for us they are client focused or it's about the outcome for the client. In, uh, in the United States there's been some uh, bar associations that have determined that um, the ability for a lawyer to work with technology is a mandatory form of yeah. um, competence and they have then required that um, lawyers take CPD in relation mm -hmm. to technology. Um, and so going back to your comment about the difference between CPD for compliance and CPD for ongoing professional development, yeah. um, I'd be interested in your thoughts on whether um, it would be a good idea to mandate that lawyers must take CPD dealing with technology or we leave it as it currently is where you know, they're able to take it if they wish, yeah. um, but it's, it's sort of up to them. I'm going to give you the great lawyer's response. I think it depends a little. Um, I think ultimately a lot of lawyers are going to have to do that regardless, whether you make it compulsory or not, in order for them to just survive and to practice and to, and to provide appropriate services for their clients, they're going to have to, whether it's mandated or not. Um, I certainly, within the programs we run, ensure that a lot of what we do under that practice management and business skills heading meets those requirements and we do a lot of work around the technology space there. Do I think it should be mandated? Look, I think kicking and screaming, some people will come to it. I'm not a big fan, to be honest, of mandated topics. Mandated competencies might be a different thing around a, a competency around um, technological understanding, I think is probably more the path I'd look at. But then I can barely turn on my iPhone, so I'm probably <laughs> the last person to ask. I, I do think that we're, we're we're getting a generation of lawyers through who are already very literate around their use of technology. And so we're talking a bit more about top up. The other thing, of course, is five years ago, about, we weren't using smartphones as a business tool. I don't know what the thing is in five years time that may require that mandated training. There may be something that changes things in such a revolutionary way we do. But I think we're going to get there almost by default.